This evening is, well, this year, I should say, sorry, is ELF's 30th anniversary. It's not, so this, this evening's event is not quite a, an, a 30th birthday party, but it does an event to mark um, the occasion. And there are many in the room who are familiar with ELF, but for those who aren't, we thought it might be useful just to give a brief introduction to ELF and our, and, and our work, uh, and which I think provides a bit of context, really, for this evening's um, event. ELF is a... We describe ourselves as a small charity, and we've been in operation for 30, 30 years. Um, the founders of ELF, Martin Polden, a solicitor, and Diana Schumacher, an environmentalist, both of whom are in the room this evening, and it's wonderful to have you here, recognised that communities in the UK facing environmental threats had nowhere to turn to for advice. Now, they were joined by the late Professor David Hall, a scientist, and ELF was formed in 1992, to assist commun communities uh, to get involved in environmental decision making affecting their quality of life. Now that cross-disciplinary element, the law, the science, the environment, echoes throughout ELF's work. And there are three main strands to that. Our advice and information, our public legal education, and our policy work. But the thread running through all of the, those three strands, joining them together, is community. Whether that's the human community, or the many communities in the natural world that ELF is so frequently called upon to assist. So just looking at our elements in a little more detail, our advice and referral service is our reactive strand. That's, we have a, over 30 years, we've built up a network of lawyers and consultants who each year provide an immense amount of pro bono support to environmental communities. We couldn't do what we do without them, and we are immensely grateful for their support, and there are many in the room this evening. Now, the environmental issues that they deal with uh, will range from the very large to the very small. Uh, you name it, over 30 years, we've probably dealt with it in some way. Uh, it might be to do with um, uh, smells, noise, the loss of wildlife habitats, the loss of green spaces, uh, the impacts of development in some way, traffic, climate change. The point is that all of, those, uh, all of those issues are environmental issues affecting people's quality of life uh, and their well-being and that of future generations. And what I think they demonstrate is the connection between people and the environment. But then after all, if I can quote one of our speakers this evening from Friday's Autumn Watch, after all, we are nature. So outreach, our proactive strand, we look to provide communities with the tools and knowledge about the system, about how to get involved in the environmental decision making affecting them, or even how to challenge a, an environmental, a poor environmental decision. In the knowledge that they can then come back to wealth if they need specific help in the future. Traditionally, we've done that in what has once been described as dusty community halls and public spaces up and down the UK. Obviously, in COVID times, things were a little more restricted. We moved into webinars. We have, uh, this year, embarked in, in the kind of hybrid world of the combination of the virtual and the in-person. In fact, the, the image on the screen there is from our event in March uh, this year at, at Imperial College um, here in London, looking at reviving UK waterways. Those two strands the advice and referral and the outreach feed our policy work on environmental justice, access to environmental justice for all. There are largely three main elements to that as well. Access to environmental information, public participation in, in environmental decision making, and access to just environmental justice not being prohibitively expensive. Now any environmental lawyers in the room will recognise there the three tenets of the Aarhus Convention, which the UK ratified. And in many ways that encompasses an awful lot of ELF's work. But our educational work is broader than just the public legal education. We have always looked to nurture and encourage the next generation of public interest environmental lawyers. And we currently do that through what we're calling our Young ELF programme in partnership with our, uh, uni our university network. We're currently working with around about 20 universities within the UK. UCL is one of them. Uh, and the, the way we do that is through two main uh, outlets. One is legal clinics, so that's an opportunity for lawyers, for, sorry, for law students to provide advice on ELF inquiries uh, under the supervision of qualified lawyers. 
the image on the screen is uh, the Gwent levels. Um, there were students at Cardiff University who were involved in the M4 Relief Road inquiry. And then more recently, we've done policy clinics. So that's an opportunity for students to have more in-depth research, empirical research, on issues arising uh, from ELF inquiries, um, and an opportunity really to, to delve, delve a bit deeper into some of these issues, providing valuable data for ELF, to be honest. It's a, a huge resource, and we're very grateful to have the student support in that way. And equally, hopefully, a, a, an interesting experience for students, um, sometimes getting to grips with the, uh, the curiosities of local authorities. The image there is from our, our Climate Emergency Declarations project. Uh, we produced, as, as a result of the research conducted by a number of universities into climate emergency declarations and action around them uh, or not from local authorities, uh, we produced a report prior to COP26 um, last year. That's available on our website for anybody um, who's interested. Uh, I think the point is really that the need for ELF is as great, if not arguably greater, than it was 30 years ago uh, when ELF was first established. And Emma will now just give a little uh, bit of background to some of the communities we work with. Thank you, Tom. So you start to see um, the shape of ELF and, 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 and the sorts of things that we are uh, involved in. Um, but I thought it would be interesting and appropriate, given the fact that we are uh, talking about this evening, standing up for nature and harnessing the power of local communities, that actually we have a little snapshot into some of those local communities um, that we work with. Um, and I think about, you know, the great privilege that I, I have in this, in this job at ELF, um, uh, those communities that, that I work with on a daily basis, and they are standing up for nature. There are hundreds of communities around the UK every day who are doing that. And ELF is there to assist and to help them uh, harness their own power. And when I think about that word power, what is the power of local communities? And actually, I know that when somebody contacts ELF, when they reach out to us for our assistance, they're doing so because they're driven by a desire to protect something, to protect something that they love, that is really special to them, is local, whether it's a tree, a local tree, a local river, uh, the public health of their community. That is the desire. It is the desire to protect. Uh, and, um, and so for me, that's a great starting point um, for working with those communities. So I wanted to just talk about, I'm going to just take a, a small sample um, uh, which just illustrates actually what it is that communities are doing in, in their standing up um, for nature. So the first community I'm going to talk about, we've, we've been working with for about two and a half years now, uh, and they are in, a, in, in Boreham Wood, um, and uh, in Boreham Wood there is a village green, and that is Woodcock Hill Village Green. Um, the, in 2006, uh, the village green, uh, the, the Woodcock Hill, after a, a, a quite a rigorous process uh, of, of designation, was finally declared a village green. Uh, and in the intervening time over the years, this community have put uh, love and energy into this green space. It's a wild green space. They've dug ponds, they've planted trees, they've celebrated, they've come together on, on this, this piece of land. And they love it. It is beautiful. I've been there. Um, Two and a half years ago, they were absolutely horrified to receive a notice from, uh, from the landowner, Taylor Wimpy, to say that uh, they would be applying to, uh, the, 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 to PINs to deregister part of Woodcock Hill and that they were proposing a replacement um, site. And legislation says that you can deregister, but you have to replace the land that is to be lost. And that land has to be of equal or better um, value. Um, well, this piece of land that was to, to replace the, that to be lost was really flat, featureless grazing land, um, not, a, not, not, not uh, with any sort of relationship to the community of Boreham Wood, 
um, and uh, it was really felt that um, in no way was, it, was its value equal to, to the land that the community really loved. And so at the beginning of this year, there was a two-week public inquiry. Um, we were all there. We worked very hard. We came up against Taylor Wimpy, of course, with their enormous resources and their quite uh, quarrelsome uh, council. Um, we had junior council. And, of course, we had the community. But um, they had experts and reports and this and that and the other. But we put up a good fight, and we, we made it very clear... I think that um, there was no there was no comparison really between the two sites, um, and and certainly no love for the for the replacement land. Um, well, uh, that was all argued, and in May of this year, we found uh, we we heard the decision from Pins, and the inspector had decided that Taylor Wimpy could indeed. Uh, deregister the the village green and and enormous devastation for the community who had worked so hard had spent thousands of pounds at a public inquiry were now faced with this prospect and the only the only thing they could do uh, now at this point was to challenge that that decision of the inspector um, and and so Six weeks, you've got six weeks into in, in which to make that decision. Uh, they, they, they made that decision to, to, to challenge. Uh, and, and now, I won't go into the detail, but we have been given permission from the court um, to, to challenge that decision. But, you know, you're looking at a community that has not only invested tens of thousands of hours of love into this land, but also tens of thousands of pounds. And, and, and it just demonstrates the lengths to which communities will go um, to defend what they love. And, and, and that is you know, a love of, of place, a love of nature, um, a love of their community. Um, then I talk about uh, Mike Owens, who is down on the, on the south coast, and Bob Latimer, who is up uh, on, on the north coast. Both men, driven by an absolute zeal to get at the truth of what is happening in their marine, local marine environment so far, as, so far as sewage pollution is concerned. They make themselves experts. They undertake citizen science. Uh, they take their communities with them. They have a voice. They have a strong voice. Uh, and they become um, very prominent in, in their local communities for, for what they are doing, challenging the Environment Agency, um, all sorts of um, different legal mechanisms that ELF is supporting them um, to undertake. Richard Price. Richard is here this evening. He is a local resident in, in Hastings, keeping an eye on the local wildlife sites. He came to us at the beginning of the year when part of the um, Clive Vale local wildlife site had been totally razed to the ground, utterly, utterly destroyed. Uh, a, a, an ecologist was then brought in by the, by the developer, by the, uh, the landowner, um, to, um, to, to do an environmental survey. Well, of course, there was nothing there. But the environmental survey was done and the application went in. We assisted um, Richard to, to, um, with an objection and indeed, fortunately, the, the application was refused. But you see, there are so many people, that is just a really small selection of the people that we work with at ELF. The local nature heroes, I've started to call them, because that is what they are to me, uh, and that is what we are, they are to Elf, and and we can help those people. That's what our well, that is what we are are there for. And um, as we look to the future, and of course, um, you know, it is a fairly bleak landscape at the moment so far as nature is concerned, but whilst there are people who will stand up and defend nature, then it feels like there is still some hope. And, um, and, and you know, Elf's role is really to rally those people and to support those people um, to take that, that stand. Uh, and it's a real privilege. Um, indeed, it's a privilege to, to work with them. 
So that's all I've got to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to Carol. Uh, Carol Day, who is um, known locally amongst environmental lawyers as Mrs. Aarhus, the Queen of Aarhus. Um, <laughs> Of grandmother, which is not so, but um, is really we're just so delighted that Carol agreed to be a trustee for for Elf, um, and uh, and of course has been standing up for nature for years. Um, so um, many thanks to Carol for for all she does, uh, and we've got our two marvellous guests here who are also, of course, um, in in a really big way standing up for nature. Um, so thank you um, to you all. Now, the importance of nature for us as individuals and for local communities is the key theme of our evening, and that's going to be the subject for our In Conversation piece um, with Chris and Maya Rose. Um, Chris doesn't really need any introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's an opportunity to embarrass him, which is always good. Um, Chris is a naturalist, he's a nature photographer, and his pictures are amazing. Television presenter and author and he was awarded a CBE for services to nature conservation in 2019. And he's one of the three directors of Wild Justice, which is a not-for-profit not organisation which basically takes cases against the governments and their agencies to, to get a better deal for nature. Now, for anybody who doesn't yet know her, because you will soon, believe me, this is uh, Dr Maya Rose Craig, who's a young British Bangladeshi ornithologist, environmentalist, diversity activist as well as an author, speaker and broadcaster. At age 11 she started the popular blog Bird Girl and at age 17 she became the youngest person to see half of the birds in the world and that's over 5,000 species of bird for those of you, um, including me, who, um, who didn't know how many birds there were in the world. So Chris and Maya Rose have known each other for a little while. I think they've bonded over the Antarctic snow petrel, looking at your book, and Maya Rose was one of Chris's uh, cabinet. He, she was the Minister for um, Diversity and Nature and Conservation in the People's Manifesto for Wildlife, uh, which was published, I think, in about 2018. We're very grateful to both of you for giving up your time to be with us for Elf's 30th birthday party, because I know you've both got insane schedules. So we can start with some questions. Can I start by asking you both? Um, when was the moment that, that you got nature, as it were, or probably more accurately, that nature got you um, and that you knew it was going to be a driving force in your lives? And I don't mind who wants to take that first. Here you go. Okay. Um, I always find that a really difficult question to answer in that I come from a family that's very into nature, particularly birds and bird watching, which is why I'm so into birds. Um, and so they were taking me out into nature literally since I was a baby, and so there never was for me a light bulb moment where I was like, wow, I love nature. It was more actually as I got a bit older and I started going to school where I had a sort of moment where I was like, wow, not everyone else loves nature, um, which was a very strange realization for me, but it's always been just such a big part of my life. And I think um, that's one of the reasons I kind of engaged with sort of wider environmental issues and environmental campaigning from such a young age. Cause I think especially for someone like of my generation, environmental issues and love of nature and the environment have always been completely 100% intertwined and sort of inextric inextricable from one another, so, yeah. Brilliant. And Chris? Well, my parents tell me that, um, that I was fascinated by everything that called and slithered and slimed around our very small garden in Southampton from the moment they put me onto the lawn. Um, my memory goes back until about four and a half uh, with some degree of clarity and I remember at that stage being obsessed by a, a, a range of different species. There were always things which were intangible. I'd always go for things that didn't live in Middenbury on, in the suburbs of Southampton. Mm -hmm. So they included um, Bechstein's bat, um, otters and, uh, and Tyrannosaurus rex, um, <laughs> which had been absent from that environment, well never yeah, actually <coughs> present in that environment actually. but. Um, yeah, so it went all the way back. And my early interest was always very much about um, capturing um, and, and in, in, in a caging um, those species to get close-up views of them. And I think the reason I was drawn to nature, when I think about that, and I don't mind you know, admitting to the superficiality of it, is that I just liked the fact that it was perfect. As individual organisms, everything I found and looked at was, was, was perfect. And a little later, I remember standing at a bus stop waiting to go to Portswood stores um, 
and uh, Sores was the clothing place my mother would take me to. I quite like the taxonomy of all the clothing that they, all, all of the materials they had there, although I did always want to change it. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, we were standing at the bus stop and there was a dead starling in the gutter and I picked it up and I think that for me that was a very formative moment. Uh, I, as I expanded its wing and looked at the way that all the fe feathers fitted together, those beautiful petrol washes on them, um, I. Yeah, and she told me to put that dirty thing down. Obviously, mm. I put it straight in my pocket so I could <laughs> examine it further that, that evening in, in, the, uh, in my bedroom. Um, but that was, you know, uh, you know, I held the bird, I felt its lightness, I looked at the, 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 the remarkable structure of that, what was then a, a common bird, and smelled it. And yeah, it was always about contact, basically. And you had a special relationship with Kestrel? From I did, local. yeah. I didn't really get into, despite the Starling incident, um, which was when I was about five and a half. I, I, I didn't really get into birds because they weren't quite tangible. They flew away, mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't put them in a jam jar or a tank or a cage. So I didn't really get into birds until I was about 12 or 13. Um, and it coincided rather obviously when I got a pair of binoculars from my father. And, and then there was a period of transition when it, it was still about owning things. It was still about keeping things. Um, and we had all sorts of wild animals as... Um, I say pets, they, they would come from um, the RSPCA and on the pretext that I would rehabilitate them, but um, I would try to take as long as possible uh, <laughs> when it came to doing that. Um, but the binoculars were at that, you know, that it, I was moving forward from that point onwards to, to, to understanding that I could learn more about the things that I loved by watching them in their own environment rather than my bedroom or back garden. But I did in, um, in 1975 have a, a kestrel which I kept and flew. Um, and again, it was a very formative r relationship in, in my life. It was utterly devoted to the bird. And um, still love kestrels very much, of course. Uh, beautiful, beautiful birds. Well, so, yeah, it was, it was it, but it was at that point about closeness. It was about proximity. I liked touching it, I liked feeling it, I liked smelling it. I liked, didn't mind getting bitten by it. It was, that was all part of it. Yeah. It obviously goes back to what Emma was saying about sort of you know proximity to nature, doesn't it? But I just want to talk a little bit about um, both of your memoirs, which I don't know whether if anybody hasn't read them. Chris's is called Fingers in the Sparkle Jar, and <coughs> Myers is called um, Bird Girl, as we might have imagined. They're both fantastic read, by the way, if you'd like to get hold of them. Um, and Chris's your memoir talks about you growing up in Southampton. It talks about your, uh, you know, as you talked about before, your sort of growing love of nature and uh, your love of punk uh, and then your kestrel before sort of embarking on your career. And Maya Rose, your, yours, as you said um, in your opening um, sort of sentences, talking about your sort of love of nature that your parents had and mm -hmm. how they took you on these incredible trips both in the UK and internationally. Mm -hmm. But one other thing that really comes through from both of your books is the issue of uh, mental health really, really strongly. Um, and I wanted to ask you both how you feel um, how important is nature in terms of people's health and well-being to us, not just as individuals, but also to, as communities of people? And what do you think it means for us to live in one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world? Mm -hmm. I, start? Um, I was unaware of what, what an asset the, the natural world was in terms of mental health when I was having a lot of difficulties. Um, as a child, I thought that the reason that I was going to spend time in the woods and the fields and the, uh, and the hedges was to get away from other people of my own age who I didn't get on with. Um, so basically I was looking for uh, solitude in a place where everything lived that I was fascinated by. What I failed to recognise at the time was that when I found those spaces and, and went there, it, it was giving me the breathing space to be able to deal with the, uh, some of the negative aspects of, of, of growing up that, that I uh, encountered and, and endured. And of course, it's, it's only much later. We're talking about the 70s here. You know, I grew up in a family where mental health was simply not discussed. Mm -hmm. you know, the man down the road, my mother would whisper to me that he had shell shock. <coughs> and that was it. I mean, it was bad enough, you know, trying to get a plaster off of my dad if I nearly severed a leg, um, <laughs> let alone, you know, raising any mental health uh, mm. issues. And it was certainly a generation where boys didn't cry, uh, long before The Cure made such an amazing <laughs> single in 1978. Um, but the, um, so it, it just wasn't on the agenda. So mm. I'm not surprised that it wasn't, you know, presented in that way and that I didn't recognise it in that way. And it wasn't really until I got to my mid-twenties that I suddenly thought, you know, there is another dimension here. I'm not only escaping uh, a part of the world which I struggle to exist in, I'm actually coming to a place where I feel really good, mm. you know. Mm. And then, of course, 
Um, I actively sought that part of the world to feel good when I needed it, which is most of the time. Um, so I, I think that it, coming from different generations it might be different from, from Maya because I think now we are aware as individuals and as communities the value of those natural green spaces. Um, and we do you know, make sure that we um, you know, try to maintain, despite what we've heard this evening and the difficulties, we try to main a maintain access to them. And they're very much you know, considered part and parcel, a, a right, if you like, um, in, in our lives. Mm. 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 Yeah. You like to come in on that? Yeah. yeah, no, I absolutely agree with all of that. I think um, sort of my experiences with all of that have been slightly different in that something I talk about in Bird Girl quite a lot is when I was about 10, my mum was diagnosed with very severe bipolar disorder. And, um, and so as my family was already very into birds and bird watching and all that sort of thing, that sort of became something that we were very actively, very consciously using as a tool to try and help with that, but not only with her own mental health issues, but sort of us as a family unit as well and trying to keep us together as sort of the activity that we did together basically. And um, so that was something that we sort of very were decisively using. Um, but I do think also, I, I agree with Chris, I think things have changed a lot even just in the last 10 years, even with just things like um, the NHS starting to do green prescribing and things like that, which is, um, you know, a very, a very explicit acknowledgement of just how important green spaces are for our brains and for mm -hmm. our mental health and our just general well-being. Um, and it's one of the reasons, actually, that I, I run a charity called Black Nature that's all about getting kids from, like, um, the city, especially from Black Nation backgrounds, into the countryside. And a lot of that is to do with my own experiences of seeing firsthand just how, not even good, just how essential it is for people to have access to those spaces and to be able to build that relationship with nature and the outdoors. Um, and I think that that is something that people know subconsciously very deep down, but maybe um, has been lost slightly over the years. Um, Although I, I suppose in contrast to that, one of the really interesting things was during lockdown, um, during that really difficult period where all the, um, all the parks, all the urban green spaces were locked up. Um, it, it was incredibly difficult, even for people who wouldn't consider themselves people who spend time in green spaces. It was really, really hard and a lot more people started venturing out into the countryside and sort of doing nature -y activities and things like that because there was this sort of hole that they realised needed to be filled and so I think um, even if it is subconsciously people do have this understanding of just how again essential it is to be able to spend time outdoors and I think the value that that has mm. in terms of community spaces especially is um, just yeah inexplicable really. Yeah I think what's frightened me about that is how short memories we've got because I think we all recognise during Covid how important it was to be able to get outside and we all thought well there's going to be a, another impetus for the government going forward they're going to realize this but it just seems to have sadly just just gone doesn't it and we seem to be back into right you know the economy is the driving force and we're seeing we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the future one, one, one of many missed tricks we might we might say yeah i would agree one of the other things I wanted to raise, which comes through in both of your books, um, is the issue of the prejudice that you've encountered in your lives. And that's um, certainly for you, Chris, around Asperger's, uh, and also for you, Maya, around being a young woman, an Islamic, um, a sort of Asian woman in conservation. And, and I, you know, I sort of really resonated with the story that you told um, about being a birder in a, in a community that, which, which is a very kind of, you know, male um, environment and you know sort of classically uh, you know women don't have a you know they're sort of quite dismissive I think I would say of women in that environment and how they can be um, you know not as sort of um, you know up with their identification as the men. Can you talk a little bit about how you have dealt with those prejudices in your lives um, and what do you think that we can do as individuals and communities to make our environmental sector more forgiving and uh, more inclusive? Yeah. You go first. Let's yeah, take, yeah. Let's, we'll take it in turns. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think definitely sort of um, prejudice, but also just sort of this idea of who it is who enjoys spending time in nature and enjoys spending time in the outdoors has been something that I've always had to deal with since I was very young and have always sort of been aware of, again, at least on a subconscious level. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier I was 11 when I first started sort of having this online platform, talking about issues that I cared about, things like that. Um, I, but there, it wasn't just me, there were other kids who were roughly my age, most of them boys, who were um, 
doing very similar things and they also talk about the birds that they're seeing at the weekend and you know the things that they want to go see and local conservation all that sort of thing and they never ever got the amount of sort of vitriol or pushback that I did online and they never ever were questioned in their love of nature or love of the outdoors and um, again it all seems very silly now but I remember when I was about 14 or 15 I was sort of having this panic because originally I'd called myself bird girl online because I was a girl and I like birds and I felt very self-explanatory. <laughs> um, but then suddenly it was this massive imposter syndrome thing where it's like because I am not the single, you know, the person with the most expertise in the world on birds, I can't call myself bird girl because, you know, that's not, I, su I suppose that's not how it works. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, also, obviously, from a very young age, being very aware that no one else was, um, or everyone else was white, essentially, in, um, <coughs> sorry, at that time of the year, mm. um, you know, in the countryside, in green spaces. Um, as my online platform got bigger, there was a lot of Islamophobia, especially online, especially on Twitter. Um, so, you know, there was, there was lots of different things going on. And I think just the thing that I was hearing over and over again is there is a very specific expectation of who spends time in nature, who is allowed to enjoy and fully appreciate nature. And that's something that I've really been pushing back against, um, pure, partially just because of my own love, and I think other people deserve that. But I think that there's so much that um, can be done even on a very, you know, grassroots community level. And that can be as simple as, um, you know, maybe recognising someone who is venturing out into a green space for the first time, that is quite a scary endeavour. They might be quite intimidated, they might be ex um, you know, expecting a ne negative experience and sort of going out of your way to be pleasant, to be friendly. It does make a big difference. Um, I think maybe having a think about the way that we talk and think about nature, because I feel like in the UK there's this sort of very um, scientific basis or expectation to it all where again it's sort of like if you don't know mm. all the calls and all the latin names mm. you can't appropriately enjoy something which obviously isn't true I, essentially it's making it sort of an enjoyable comfortable space for people to be able to spend time in so i think again especially on mm. a community level that's what it's supposed to be mm. that's brilliant chris um, i've got to be oh, very honest with you but one of the things that gets me up in the morning and, and motivates me is guilt um <laughs> because um I'm 61 years old and I've failed, and my generation have failed in a number of important ventures. Um, firstly, we live in one of the most nature deplete, uh, depleted set of nations in the world, and many of those declines have spun out at their most catastrophic levels in my lifetime, mm. whilst I've been active and interested in conservation. Um, so we're seeing massive declines in habitat and species, so on and so forth. So we as conservationists in the UK have you know, been doing our bit, but we've done nothing uh, well enough uh, in order to halt those declines. So I'm not very proud of that. And another thing is that I've been aware for a very long time of all of the injustices that Maya has railed against so brilliantly, and yet we did nothing about that either. And I remember it must have been at least 25 years ago, very excited because the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers had conducted, as I was aware at the time, the only investigation into why black and Asian people were not comfortable and active in the mm, environment. And we all gathered together in a small room and it was well attended, I have to say, and they produced a little document and we looked at it and I thought, great, at last, you know, we'll, we'll see changes, you know, we'll be able to go into a hide and see a far greater diversity of people. But it simply didn't happen because the other NGOs never addressed that issue. Mm. And as Maya um, mm. eloquently um, wrote in the manifesto, you know, we still have one of the lowest levels of recruitment mm. from those backgrounds. Mm in the environmental movement compared to anything else. So mm. we're still failing. Mm. Maya's doing everything she can to rectify that in, mm. in, in super, super smart time, which is great, but it just didn't ought to, to, to be that way yeah. in, in any way, shape and form. And, and in terms of sort of being the, uh, what should we say, victim of prejudice, I don't think I was the victim of prejudice. I think I was the victim of ignorance. And I, I don't harbour any recriminations because when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, people didn't know what autism was. The, the, the kids in my class who were unbelievably cruel and, and horrific, really, at times, they, they didn't understand what they were dealing with. You know, now I spend a lot of my time advocating for autism so that young people do recognise that it's simply a difference in mm. the way that people's brains are and therefore the way that they express their personality. 
and, and therefore through small changes in their behaviour they can build a comfortable environment for themselves and other people too. So it, it, it wasn't so much prejudice, it was alienation through ignorance. Mm. Um, but now times have moved on and I, I, in recent weeks I've been to a number of schools where there are trained staff, healthcare professionals in, in, in essence, um, who are working in mainstream schools I, I'm talking about, work, working with young autistic people and having spoken to them, I mean I wouldn't say that they're, they're feeling 100% but they're up in the 70s and I was down in the 10s. Mm. So we, we have made significant progress there. And in terms of you know any negative impact that might have had on my, uh, what should we say, career, if you can call it that, um, then I would say it's been, l l well, I don't know. No, through, through the, the formal education process, it was pretty hellish at sixth form and university. However, the attributes that the condition gives me allow me to do my job I can remember stuff mm. from when I was four and a half, like it was just yesterday. And that's one of the benefits that, that you know, I, I'm able to draw upon in, to do the, the work that I do. So not all bad, you know, it's, mm. there are good sides to it as well. I'm always keen to extol those and make sure people understand that autistic people like myself can play a functional uh, role and, and, and actually, without being too forceful, deserve the right to play that functional mm. role as, as well. As much as uh, black and Asian people have every right to be in those bird's hides and we should have been encouraging that and dealing with this issue long, long ago. Yeah. I can certainly vouch for your photographic memory uh, in terms of doing witness statements. It's an incredibly um, helpful fact. <laughs> um, can I ask a question to Maya next, actually? Um, I mean, it's, it's easy to forget you're only 20 years old and um, I mean, one of the things that really came through reading your book is just how much you've managed to achieve at such a young age. And I think I first realised this person's going to be really extraordinary when you talk about reading My Family and Other Animals when you were six. Now, I studied that book for my O-level, my English O-level, and that shows how old I was because I'm saying O-level, not GCSE. So the fact that you did that then sort of made me think, aha, and then you set up Black for Nature when you were just 14, which is incredible. Now, Tom talked a little bit about young elf, and, and elf, you know, we do try to do things with, with young children, but that's kind of 18 plus. But I did just think, what do you, what do you think children uh, and young adults think about the state of the planet that they're inheriting? Um, and what can we do to really equip them um, as young people to try and address the challenges that we face? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you mentioned My Family and Other Animals. That was my favourite book from ages, like, about five through to 12, probably. Um, I loved the idea of another kid my age who's sort of equally or possibly more obsessed about nature than I was. Um, as I mentioned before, I didn't know many kids my age at the time who, who um, thought that liking nature was normal, basically. Um, I think... I can't remember the question, that's really bad. Just about, just it's, really, <laughs> no, it's just about really young people. What do you oh, think yeah, we can yeah, do? Oh, I mean, you've done, you've done a lot through Black for Nature, but you know, is, how do you think we can be engaging young people to, yeah, yeah. to sort of really address these challenges? I think sort of my generation and younger has quite a weird relationship with nature and the environment and the planet. In that it's, sort of, it's my generation and below that, um, you know, we're... I sort of think of us as the climate change generation, like one of the questions I got asked a lot is sort of when, did, when do you remember learning about climate change? And it's like I don't remember because I was born in 2002 so it's been a reality <laughs> for my whole life. You know, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and it's very, very rare for me to meet someone um, within that age group who wasn't deeply concerned about the state of the planet but more than that is willing to do something about it. Like I remember when the Youth Strikes for Climate first popped up in the UK. Everyone I knew was going for them, but more than that, everyone I knew was very excited that something was actually happening. And so this is a generation of people who are deeply concerned about the future. Um, but I think at the same time, climate change as an issue has been very separated from um, you know, nature-based issues and biodiversity mm. loss, even though they are essentially two sides of the same coin. They're so totally um, interlinked. And so I think a lot of people who think a lot about climate change and are very concerned about climate change, um, don't think about nature very much, would, wouldn't consider going out into nature or engaging with nature, they probably think it's quite boring, and probably don't have that understanding of how biodiversity loss can cause as many problems as climate change within the UK, as such a, um, you know, a country with such a lack of biodiversity. And so I think there's this very weird sort of contrast going on. 
Um, but I think that is genuinely just lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think talking to people about things like um, rewilding, for example, and talking about very easy ways to start to solve our biodiversity and the issue in the UK, and actually explaining how that does connect into climate change and how that can solve bigger issues. Um, so, for example, I'm a big advocate of beavers. I'm, mm. I represent Beaver Trust, and you know that always goes down well because they're very cute. They're sort of a very PR-friendly animal, um, and they're really good for biodiversity. They're also really good for flood control, which is a really big issue where I live in the southwest. Um, and so, I think when you do explain that to people, sort of that very low-level way that it all connects together, it does also give people hope because um, it's a very tangible way to go about at least managing things rather than just constantly talking about um, you know, governments and oil companies which always feels very difficult to tackle and very far away and so I, I do strongly believe that sort of helping people to understand that would make a big difference within the climate change movement and also just quickly in terms of my work with Black to Nature um, I've already talked about sort of the mental health side of it which is one of the reasons it's such an important project to me but one of the other parts is because I don't, I think it's very unreasonable to expect people to care about and understand nature based issues if they have never had the opportunity to experience mm -hmm. nature. I don't think anyone um, would ever really understand or care about biodiversity loss if they've never loved biodiversity. And so I think also taking kids out into nature, giving them that opportunity to build that relationship, is also how you engage more people. <coughs> sorry, with environmental issues, um, you know, in a period where we're dealing with so many different environmental crises. Yeah. It's really interesting you're talking about that separation of climate change and biodiversity. I mean, that may have come, it comes a lot, I think, from the environmental NGOs. I mean, I worked for WWF for many years where those were treated as two completely separate programmes. And, you know, in fact, you know, one of them would have priority over the other at different stages of the organisation. So it's not surprising. It's come from yeah. the people who are supposed to be kind of making those links themselves. But... Anyway, okay, Chris, can I, I've got to ask you some questions about the law, obviously, because it's the Environmental Law Foundation. So can I ask you what your experience have been of using the law in terms of environmental protection? Are you um, an advocate for it or not? Yes. Well, it, uh, going back, again, let's go back to the 70s, it was poor. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm sat here today, because I was unable to access uh, 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 the law, if you like, or see that law implemented and upheld. One of the characteristics of um, well, common, uh, common traits of, of, of people with a bone like mine is that we have an aggravated sense of injustice. We don't like getting blamed for things. We don't like uh, the wrong thing happening when the right can. And we certainly don't like people getting away with things. Um, so my early experiences were of trees being cut down when they shouldn't have been, badgers being bulldozed when they you know, definitely shouldn't have been. Um, and that was, again, a very powerful motivating force. Um, then, of course, we've lived through a time, I've lived through a time where we've redrafted laws. There was obviously 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, because uh, initially, certainly from the ornithological point of view, it was the Birds Act, Act of 54, where everything was in their schedules. And then we've had the Habitats Directive, or the U EU legislation. But. Um, and then again, you know, that, so that was all good. It was a, a really useful framework, strong and, 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 and useful for building, if you like, all of the protective uh, measures that we have, particularly, you know, when it comes to designating land with Ramsars and everything else. Um, but then, you know, you go and stand in Malta and you watch people shooting, you know, turtle doves, species mm. that's declined by 93% since 1970 in the UK out of the air. Um, because they've invented a derogation to that law which allows them to, to, to get round it. And you think, what's the law worth? What's, what was all of that effort from all of those people who drafted that legislation worth if a yob with a gun in um, Malta can just blow these things out of the air? And then you go to Cyprus where there is no derogation, so they haven't circumvented the law at all. They're just acting illegally, but there's no one there implementing the fact that they are killing two, two million black caps, etc., every single year. Um, but again, it, it's fuel. It just makes me think, okay, the law's in place. What can we do to work to, to make sure that it's, that it's upheld? Mm. Um, hence wild justice, and that was a niche that we, we thought about. The environmental NGOs um, hadn't been looking at the, the, the legal side of things, 
So with your good selves at Lee Day, you know, our mission was, okay, let's take a look at, we started with the general licenses, as, as you know. Let's take a look at these. Let's see if, firstly, are they functional? Are they right and proper? If they're not, are there reasons why, legislative reasons why they're not? And, and then thirdly, can we challenge mm. them? And we found that there were uh, good grounds to challenge them, and that's what we, we continue to do. So I suppose, while justice, that's Mark Avery with Tingo and myself, you know, if you like, we found a, a vacant niche that mm. people were not, if they had explored them, they weren't doing so regularly. And it's proved really popular because despite the fact that I don't think we've yet had a gurning moment on any um, steps outside a courtroom um, in, in the Canva flash, i.e. a big legal mm. victory on that sort of stage. But we've won, uh, as you know, a, a few of our cases, and whether we've won or lost them, um, we've made a lot of noise and equally I think just about all of the things that we've that we've challenged, we've seen changes mm. because you know some people have jumped before we've needed to push them. So in terms of general licences, there isn't a general licence uh, I don't think in the UK now that hasn't changed in the time that mm. we've started you know um, a, a appealing and investigating the way that they are um, structured. So. Yeah, we've seen sig significant changes on, in, in that regard. And um, just before we go on, I think it's going back to what Maya was saying. So, young people have necessarily found a voice because they're about to inherit a world which we really messed up for them and they're going to have a very, very difficult time. And, and those in that fraternity that are aware are raising their voice principally because I think they're very frightened. And, you know, when you look at the um, young people who are working with Just Stop Oil and they're gluing themselves to paintings and so on and so forth, now you may not agree with their methodology, but you have to understand their motivation. Mm -hmm. And I think their principal motivation is fear. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who, following Fridays to Future and Extinction Rebellion, and again, a lot of young people were attendees to, the, to those demonstrations. Um, a lot of people are saying, well, we're, we're listening to young people. Well, I'm absolutely sick of that patronising gibberish. It, you know, <laughs> listening to people is not enough. We need to trust young people at this point to make decisions, because they make decisions in different ways than we do. Firstly, they're not risk averse. And one of the reasons that we've got the problems I think that we have in terms of our, the, the burden of guilt from the, what should we say, environmental care sector, is that we never took risks. We always had to sit through this mm. committee. We, we mm. found reasons to not do something rather than to just do something. And that ground everything to a standstill and those decisions weren't made in time. Young people think clearly because their minds are not cluttered by rules, regulations or political affiliations which we build up. And I have a on my phone, I have a reply from an NGO today who basically have allowed a very serious trans uh, transgression of something that's, yeah, I've got to be speak carefully here because I'm going <laughs> to give away who it is and what it is, but, but something very bad has happened. Uh, and I questioned what they were going to do about it. And basically they've come back and said, well, we can't really do too much about it because we've got other partnerships working there and we can't upset the apple cart. And that is red rag to my bull. And, you know, and that is not the action of a clear thinking, determined, mm. passionate, energetic, ambitious young person. That is the cluttered mind of a committee that is not acting properly. Mm. And they haven't had my reply yet. <laughs> they're not going to want to read it. Because I, you know, I cannot countenance that sort of thing. And you know, again, that's why I think we should be investing in young people by giving them the opportunity to make those decisions. Mm. Let me tell you, if the, if the board and the council of that um, ENGO had young people on it, I wouldn't have got that text. Mm. They'd have mm. done what was right. And what was right would be to deal with this transgression, not let it drift away because they've got some other pathetic affiliations which are cluttering their, mm. um, actually, their sense of duty of, of what's right and wrong. Mm. So now is the time, I think, well, we, we all know now is the time for change. We've got to change our, our, our minds so that we can change our practices or we don't have a future. But certainly when it comes to young people, you know, it's about, forget listening and investing, just bring them on board and let them take the helm some of the time. Mm. And of course they make mistakes. We, haven't we all? Mm. Haven't we mm. all? Plenty of them. No, there's, well, it's a really good sort of segue into sort of thinking a bit about the future. 
There's a great pic again in, in your book, Maya, where you talk about meeting Jacob Rees-Mogg, <laughs> your local MP, and uh, you say, we didn't really have much in common, which is surprising. But um, no, it's a really poignant moment. And I'd just like you both to imagine that you are in a room with uh, Rishi Sunak and his cabinet, and that includes Therese Coffey, the new Secretary of State for the Environment. What, do you, what, do you, what would you want to say to them? What, what do you think are their priorities? What do they need to be doing? Uh, well, I suppose the first thing is, um, can we have a general election, please? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I think we are, we're living through it. I mean, again, you know, it's, it's so disempowering. We, 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 uh, going back to the young people again, young people find their voice. They, they, they raise their voice. They do so in a constructive, peaceful, clear way. But, you know, very little changes. Because we have elected representatives who are wholly, or, you know, or pretty much, you know, just not accountable for their actions, mm. and that's so disempowering for young people. I mean, we were brought up with an idea that we lived in a democracy and we could put a cross in a box, and that cross would make a difference. What we've learned in recent years is that it's meaningless, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't even have a parliament; we just have a cabinet, and the cabinet is is well. We've seen what's happened. In I don't need to, to, to lay anything out. Everyone knows exactly what, what, what's going on here. And that is entirely disempowering for all of us. So if we're in a room with Rishi and Teresa, mm. you know, um, you know what, no matter what, I, I have not a germ or a cell in my body which suggests that anything that I could inform them, that they would you know, necessarily take on board mm. and, and, and act as best informed advice. Mm. I feel disempowered as an adult. Imagine how young people feel, young people who are coming to vote for the first time. And when you think of the significant elections, Brexit, last election, the, the, the percentage of young voters, voters was very small. Mm. Why? Because mm. they didn't think it was worth it. And we've got to recover mm. that. We've got to rebuild trust in politics so that we believe that our elected representatives will represent us because we've elected them. And that's something I think where, again, young people have a role to play because we've got to hold them to account, mm. which is why, at this point in time, we've got to constantly remind them that the environment needs to be on the agenda. Mm. You know, if, if, if frankly, and, and purely metaphorically, if Rishi doesn't go to the cop, then we ought to burn something down. Mm. Mm. You know? mm. Because that's not what we've elected this government for in this time of crisis. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, but I don't know. I, I suppose it's going to take me a long time. I don't, you know, my, but it's going to take me a long time to recover from a sense of utter hopelessness when it comes to their ability to grasp and act upon environmental issues, mm -hmm. let alone with the urgency that we all, you know, know is, is required at this point. Mm -hmm. Maya, do you feel mm -hmm. any less <laughs> than I do? I think um, I had a really interesting conversation with someone at uni a few days ago, actually, where we were talking about, um, or the, no, they were talking about environmental issues with the assumption that for anything to be done, um, it would have to be under a Labour government. And the basis of that was them saying, well, environmental issues are liberal issues. And I was saying, no, they're not. They're just issues. Um, and so I think, to go back to what you're saying about sort of feeling like this government does not care about environmental issues, I feel like it boils down to this really strange phenomenon we've seen in the last few years or so, where suddenly um, environmental issues, including climate change, have become um, sort of politicised within the spectrum. And so it's, it's sort of gone mm. from historically it would have been like, oh, you know, if you're right wing, you're going to solve this issue in sort of economic thinking ways. And if you're on the left, you're going to solve it in sort of liberal ways. Versus now it's like, if you're part of the Conservative Party, you're not supposed to care about the environment or engage with environmental issues, while if you're um, part of you know, any left-wing parties, that's, sort of, that's your thing. And I think that that is so totally absurd, and it's such a strange way for politics to be working, and I think that is at the root of a lot of issues that the UK has, the government has to do with um, both climate change and biodiversity loss, and I think an example of that can be... Um, you know, HS2, which was such a waste of money and was essentially continued to be pushed through to sort of make a point to environmentalists, um, which is such a bizarre yeah. reason to send billions of pounds. Um, but I think that this sort of um, polarisation of politics surrounding the environment is one of the reasons why I personally do feel quite hopeless in terms of 
um, this government and environmental issues. Um, but I think to contrast that, like, I do still personally feel that hope is extremely important and I think it is actually quite a radical act in and of itself to be hopeful <laughs> um, in that, um, you know, if you look back 20 years ago, the sort of the approach of various oil companies, including BP, was to sort of turn environmentalism into individualism um, to sort of boil it down to a single person's actions and sort of turn it into a moral thing rather than a wide social thing and mm -hmm. now that um, people have finally started to catch on to that but especially young activists they've now shifted to um, spreading essentially despondency and hopelessness it's a very active campaign and so I think um, for me like engaging in um, the wider environmental movement especially the youth movement talking to other activists meeting other people who do care very deeply about these things and are working really hard to try and make to try and have a future. That is what personally keeps me going. Like even at COP last year I had a terrible time, I'm not going back this year. <laughs> but like um, and personally I think that COP was a failure. But um, in contrast to all the stuff that was going on inside the conference, outside in the streets, it was this amazing show of solidarity of people around the world who had come together to show that they were watching their governments and this was something that they cared about and I, I think again it's sort of I'm so glad that finally there's been this shift back towards community based activism mm. rather than the sort of individualism which I don't think ever really worked. Mm. Well I think yeah absolutely I mean you, you've answered my final question which was going to be mm -hmm. about are you hopeful which you kind of but, um, but I think going back to that sort of point about communities which is very much where we started from I mean that was going to be one of my other questions was really you know you know, what do you think that communities of people, whether they are people, you know, linked by their geography or by their, you know, various other things that make up a community, what can people do? And I mean, one of the things I know, Chris, that you're organising at the moment is a walk for wildlife. And presumably that's just one thing that we can do. But can you think of any, you know, are those the kind of things that we should be doing? How, how can we be expressing this well, I mean, position? I think it's all about empowerment, isn't it, really? We do empower ourselves as individuals. You know, we make choices um, when we act upon opportunities that arise for us to be better in whatever form, and that might be environmental. And those choices arrive thick and fast now. So we all know that as we leave here tonight, there are things that we could do in our life. There are changes that we could make in our individual, everyday lives, which would essentially make us better people because they would make us more environmentally friendly organisms at this critical point. Um, some people move to those quite quickly, some people more slowly, um, and some people seem quite intransigent. So we, we have to recognise that that's going to be a period of transition and we have to be tolerant of that fact. Um, but at the same time, when we do make those choices, they make us feel good. You know, I, I feel good. I don't feel better than anyone else, but I feel good about myself. Then, of course, when we share those ideas in communities and we come together, as in the stories that we were listening to earlier, the accounts we were listening to earlier, um, then we, we get that community empowerment. And there's immediately a synergy there. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got 10 people who are feeling great because they've done something, there's a bigger energy than 10 individuals. I think where we, we've not made the next step is yet is that those communities have become empowered and sometimes they're successful with that empowerment and it makes community level difference and then the community can feel good about it. I think what we've got to do, hence Walk for Wildlife, which you know is on November the 26th by the way, here in London, we're trying to schedule others for Glasgow, Manchester, Belfast and, uh, and Cardiff but we're struggling to find people help, to help us do that at the moment. We've got maybe three on the go. Um, it is, it's, it's all inclusive. We want everyone to come. I don't care if you're just stop oil. I don't care if you're <coughs> Extinction Rebellion, mm. RSPB, RSPCA. We've all got a commonality of interest, and that is the health and well-being of, of our, mm. our environment. And I want those people to stand shoulder to shoulder, and I want them to feel m more empowered. Mm. Because until the communities reach up to the decision makers or influence them so that they recognise that in order to get the cross in the box they've got to do what we want when it comes to the environment and they can't shirk their responsibilities. Until we get to that point then those communities need to step up and I think that at this point in time that's a stumbling block. Mm. And so my plea to everyone tonight is, you know, 
in a way, I suppose we're all activists. There's probably unlikely to be anyone here who hasn't signed a petition. <laughs> um, please sign ours. We're trying to change the shooting season for Woodcock. Um, you know, we're killing 160,000 of these beautiful red-listed birds. Maya will go all weak at the knees like I will if we start talking about woodcock too long. They are absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. We're still shooting in the UK. It's absolutely bonkers. There's a petition running to, to, to change the shooting season, which we feel is a low-hanging fruit. Um, and it could be done instantaneously with a statutory instrument in, in government, and that's about it. Um, so that's activism. You know, that's on your phone. Um, then there are you know, people who would maybe they'll do, 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 do something more. They'll take part in, you know, they'll sign up with ALF mm. and, and they'll take action as a community. But I think what we all need to do at this point is think, OK, this is our comfort point. This is what we're comfortable doing at the moment. We don't want to get arrested. We don't want to block a road and we don't want to glue ourselves to something. And we <laughs> certainly don't want to hang off the Dartford Bridge. Right? <laughs> but at, when we leave, we've got to think it's time to step up. You've got to shift up a level in terms of your activism. Mm -hmm. And I think communities per se need to step up that extra level. They, mm -hmm. Whether that means that they've got to come together geographically or online, wherever it happens to be. But if we don't turn these governments around very quickly, then the simple facts are, and it's written on the wall by peer-reviewed science, we are in deep, deep trouble. And mm -hmm. we are running out of time to make a last stand. And as a consequence of that, I just think that at a certain point in the future, I don't want someone who's you know, a fraction of my age tapping me on the knee saying, what did you do when you really needed to act? Mm. And if I can't say, well, I did everything I could, mm. I did this, this and this, then I'm not going to enjoy a happy death. And who wants that as their future? <laughs> Absolutely. Would you like to add anything to that, Mike? Yeah, totally. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I guess in terms of activism, I've spent a lot of time, because I know so many activists who sort of feel like they're, they're fake activists, um, and then I had to really think about what that word meant. In the end, it just boils down to some, someone who's doing something to try and make things better. Um, and so I think, you know, doing your bit, however that manifests itself, is really important, both again in terms of, like Chris was saying, um, like actually getting things done, levelling up, and also again in terms of um, managing to maintain hope and things like that. I think a really interesting example actually is from like my local community where I live near Bristol, which there's been a few really cool things over the years. For example, well, now that fracking mm. is sort of being discussed again, um, I remember back when they originally were trying to introduce um, fracking licenses in our local area, I have never seen um, a very large amount of people from you know various communities sort of come together to really fight something in so many different directions sort of in terms of mm. campaigning in terms of looking into the law um in terms of like bothering our local mp um which i'm a big fan of you know the, the, it, you know it was it was a big thing it was a massive thing and it was people who did not normally think about environmental issues who came together and for me that was um a really exciting example of um community-based activism they did they did succeed um so, you know, Mr. Rhys Mogg saying he'd be happy to have fracking happen in his back garden. It's not true. Um, <laughs> his community would not be happy with that. Um, a more recent really nice example is um, my village, which is a very, it's a very small place. You know, there's probably a few hundred people who live there, but they declared a climate emergency a few years ago. And that means that everything they do on a local bureaucratic level has to be done through the lens of climate change. It means that they've set up a climate change committee where they're looking as a community how they can tackle things, looking into like local community gardens and orchards and allotments into car sharing. You know, it's all of those things that, um, you know, again, it does make a difference. And so I think, um, you know, there is a lot of strength within the community. I'm also, I do think, um, Really, I'm, I'm also a big advocate for really reminding our MPs that we are watching and that we are, this is something that we very deeply care about. I think it's very easy for them to become complacent. Um, so personally, I do send my MP sort of semi-regular letters sort of being like, I saw you voted about this. Why did you do that? That's yeah. not in the interest of the community that you represent. And I think doing that over a long period of time from many different people within their constituency, they remain very aware that people, this is something that people care about and this could make or break it at the next um, election yeah. for them. And so I think that also makes a big difference. Absolutely. Scrutiny and accountability. Yeah, absolutely. I, agree. I think we need more accountability for our politicians. Yeah. yeah. No, there's brilliant ideas there. We must make sure that everybody at Woodcock Hill signs Chris's petition, OK? Um, I think it would be a really good opportunity to open the floor up uh, for some questions. I think we have got, Rob's got a roving mic, so um, 
Let me just have a quick look at my... We've got a quarter of an hour. We can go a little bit over, I guess, as well. But if anybody's got any questions, it would be great. Chris, we met 20 years ago when I was chair of BBCB. set up a wonderful programme with a lot of lottery money that was called Environments for All. And it worked with inner city communities around the country to engage a huge breadth of people <coughs> to deliver on the sort of post-Rio habitat action plans, engaging people. And it takes an organization with good roots to get in there and drag people into parks where they didn't think they had permission to go there and make a world fit for nature that was better protected from the ravages of people. And this thing didn't get funded in the austerity years, and that's why it's disappeared. The big charities that could fund it aren't interested. They do tokenistic stuff. But the work that we did, that you admired, and I know that you're engaged with that thinking, have got people's imagination in groups that otherwise are not engaged with civil society, because sometimes they're the first generations coming in. And what was really exciting was thinking about and knowing, in some cases, what their children did later, including interesting things that, you know, I've kept up with something. But really, one of the things that we still have to face now is how to capture their imagination of anybody into the field that you're working in, into getting them to study nature, to be engaged in civil society, to understand the value of lawyers in this field. And I just would love to hear what you think of your one simple tool that would get people involved in this environmental conservation and connection. I could be cruel and say fear, uh, because I think that when it comes to it, we will all act. I mean, that's when you look at the history of humanity, that's what tends to happen. We don't tend to do much until we've tripped over and squeezed our knee, and then we immediately come up with um, some antiseptic and a sticky plaster. Um, and, and that's, we're really, really good at cure. We're just not so good at prevention. And I think that one of the reasons why, particularly here in the UK at the moment, um, we're not addressing some of the bigger issues or asking our elected representatives to deal with those issues as forthrightly as we might is because they're not quite hurting us enough. And that's not to say there haven't been people whose lives, businesses and futures haven't already been harmed by climate change and biodiversity loss. They have. Um, and and we obviously we sympathise with that. But everyday people are only just beginning to learn that the world is a really small place. A war in Ukraine means that people will go cold this winter and be making choices about their heating bill versus their supermarket bill. And, and Ukraine is one country out of 200 and something, uh, argued by the United Nations, the, the precise number. Um, and, and it is a small planet, and, and, and our, everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis has an impact both here and elsewhere. And I think that when people begin to realise that, and it could be food prices, it could be migration, it could be anything, then they'll, they'll, they will start to act. That's a rather <coughs> bleak outlook. I think when it comes to in, in engaging people, we, we continue to ply our trade when it comes to trying to generate an affinity for the natural world um, so that we can utilise that affinity when it comes to the crunch. The RSPB would argue that they're doing a great job, they've got more than a million members, but they've got to use those members. And as you point out, they didn't use them to solve the problem that you were trying to address. The NGO that have sent me this horrific you can tell I'm really angry about this tweet, right? Um, <laughs> they, they, that. they are not going to use their strength, integrity, credibility and members to deal with an issue which is really, really disgraceful because they lack the, the courage to do it. At what point are we going to find that courage? At what point does affinity actually count for something? It's all very well engaging people, bringing them on board, getting them excited, but then frankly we've got to be able to tap into their you know, their real desire to, to do something meaningful. And that's where I think that the, the, there's the gap at the moment. Um, and, and we're not crossing that, that divide. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I think that 
we can continue. We do a great job of engaging uh, people. You know, you can't say we're failing. Um, Maya's here, she's written a book about her passion for birds. So you've only been here for 20 years or something? Mm. 20 years. <laughs> So, you know, there were people, there were still people coming on board who developed intense passions, enthusiasms, and energy for all of that. Um, so we're not entirely failing, but it's a, it's a question of actually making a difference. And I, I, I do think we're, we're still just too lazy, not aware of our strengths. The gone should be the days when we were the humble environmentalists tapping on the door saying, oh, excuse me, um, I think there might be, a, oh no, it's okay, I'll come back tomorrow. And isn't that what Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion are doing? Are they not saying, hold on a moment, we're telling you the truth? They are vectors for the truth you know, that has been produced by the, 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 those scientists. And we're telling you the truth and we want you to act. That's why they command some of my respect and quite often a lot of my support. Um, because they're, act they're actually just doing something. As I said before, you may not agree with the motives, but you've got to think about the motivation. Yeah. Amanda, I was also we had a question in advance actually from Richard from Stop Climate Catastrophe. Is he just want to check? Is he here? Richard, brilliant. Okay, well if we have Amanda and then we'll come to you afterwards, Richard, if that's okay. Thanks. Um, I just I feel slightly awkward asking this question um, in a in a legal context, particularly as I'm a trustee at Elf, so hi, I'm Amanda. Um, but I want to know how worried you are and how far you would go. Um, to support the environment, because I'm extremely concerned about the bill that's passing through Parliament and the fact that our new Home Secretary will be able to lock us up and tag us if we organise a protest. So if we just choose to bring our community together and hold hands in the road to say, don't build on this land or don't put my, that nuclear power station next door, tell where I live, um, <laughs> we could be locked up, we could be banned, and we could be banned from using the internet. How can we... How can we challenge that? What can we do to fight that? Because that could be potentially disastrous and repressive for all of us. And I don't know how many of us need to get locked up. I'm not suggesting we'll do ourselves the road, but, but that is actually quite a worrying trend, isn't it? That one of the actual vehicles we have for making our voices heard, which is peaceful protest, is going to be criminalised. Um, it's terrifying, isn't it? I mean, we've seen it happen. States, well, it? It, it happened in my father's lifetime. We, we've seen similar sorts of things, I think, without being over dramatic. Um, it's one of those things, isn't it? We keep thinking it can't get any worse, and then it becomes normalised, and then something else happens, and we think, oh, it can't get any worse, and then we normalise it. And then, then we look back with the benefit of hindsight, and we look at the difference between when it started getting quite bad and where it's at now, and we realise we're really in the shit. You know, and, and we're almost at that point now, aren't we? Because if this bill goes through, and people, everyday people like yourselves, like the people that we've heard of tonight who are wanting to protect a, an area of land which they've significantly invested in and plays a significant role in their life, can't um, play a role in a peaceful, non-violent protest, then maybe we get our own boat and just go somewhere else. Because frankly, what are the alternatives? We, we, you know, we don't want a violent alternative to this, but we have to change a system of governments that thinks that that's okay. And we don't have that option at this particular point in time, but certainly going into the next democratic, first past the post democracy nonsense, um, you know, uh, uh, round of elections, we've got to get rid of those people. We've got to ensure that the people are, are trustworthy and they're not going to leave us in that sort of predicament because that degree of authoritarianism is terrifying. You know, we can't be complacent about that at all. But again, you see at the moment, you know, everybody's saying this is because, well, I've seen it, they're the, the spoken from those politicians. They, they're sick of Just Stop Oil and they're sick of Extinction Rebellion. Well, hold on a minute. Next, it could be race matters. It could be gender matters. It could be economic matters. There's everything in our lives. It doesn't matter what you're going to be demonstrating about. If you're too loud, too noisy, or you're standing in the road, you're going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. So we've got to recognise the degree of danger that there are, there is there. But then on the horizon, we've also got the whole EU <laughs> all reforms coming up. And that's going to be catastrophic mm. if that isn't regulated. So difficult time for a difficult government, but we just got to keep our eye on the ball, I think. That's what it comes down to. And we have to stand up and be counted. And I'm sure that there will be points when that, as we you know, move towards that piece of legislation ever 
becoming um, entrenched that we'll have to do the decent thing and take to the streets. Mm. But we did that, didn't we? I remember being one of a million people saying we mm. didn't want a war, mm. and there was a war. And no, saying, more accountability. Yeah, Maya, please come. Really, really quickly, is that one? I think. Um, British people have always been quite rubbish at protesting until we're really, really pushed to the limit. I'd love to see if they try to pass something like this in France, for example, sort of what, what would happen. But like, I, do, I do think eventually we will get to the point of no return where people are um, angry enough. But I do think in contrast, like one of the really interesting things is even within Extinction Rebellion, there has been this slight culture shift where it's gone from like getting arrested is the right thing to do versus um, there's not much point, basically, because they're sort of they're prepared and they're ready for us, and so numbers really are the critical thing. It's about you need three percent of the population to be mobilised in order to create massive social change. So that's what we need. Um, but I think also one of the reasons I find these new laws very very worrying is for me, even though they're not they're um, very dissimilar, it reminds me a lot of um, that period period of animal rights protesting in the 80s where you had these laws where essentially they could just decide if they wanted to get you in trouble, they wanted to criminalise you, and it didn't really matter what you were doing because they were vague enough. And that's very much what these protest laws um, feel like to me as someone who, you know, a lad I went to primary school with is, is, is in prison right now for, pro for uh, going to the um, Kill the Bill protest. Like, it is very authoritarian. And so I do hope um, eventually the people will realise that and they will push back sooner rather than later, but really what we need is a general election. Can I just go to Richard first and then can we come back to you afterwards? Is that okay? Brilliant. Richard, do you want to ask your question? Sure. <coughs> um, thank you. Yeah. Um, we've had from Labour uh, growth, 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 and uh, we've had from the Conservatives growth at any cost. Um, have you heard, either of you, of degrowth? And um, in particular, I was going to quote something from Jason Hickel's book, which is, as the evidence about the relationship between GDP growth and ecological breakdown continues to mount from the scientists around the world, they're shifting their approach. So I suppose the question is, since no ecologists or scientists end up in government, how are we going to stop politicians from ignoring the science? That's a question. Thanks. Well, I can hear that, yeah. I'm not, I'm not an economist. I'm essentially an ecologist. But I know that if you've got a limited amount of resources and you keep consuming them, they'll run out and everything will fall apart. Um, and again, the idea that we can consume our way out of this crisis is so bonkers. Um, that it's almost unbelievable. But that's what we're asked to believe every day when they talk about more growth um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and more consumption and that we're going to build, build, build or whatever the latest you know, mantra is. Um, and, and we all know it, it frankly won't work. It will just implode and collapse. Um, and the cost of that will be societal collapse as, we, as we're told by the IPCC. And that's not you know, some sort of glib statement. That's actually you know, independently assessed climate scientists which are, are predicting that as, as part and parcel of our prospective future. Um, I don't know, what, what do they do? At what point do they fail badly enough to realise they've got to change? You know, the, the, the combination of, uh, well, COVID should have given us so many opportunities to restructure the way that we live our mm -hmm. lives and run our businesses and economy. And they were entirely wasted by insane short-termism but then again short-termism is fueled by the system of government that we have isn't it you know you as Maya was saying you, know, you, you can't address envi sh uh, environmental issues should be apolitical because you can't address them adequately in terms of political office mm. it's just not feasible and, and no one will have the bravery to even try to do that so as I argued in the manifesto you know in order to get through this with as much comfort and uh, efficacy as possible, we need to make those issues apolitical. We need to take them outside of politics. But again, that's that. As I, you know, every time I say that, people say you're such an idealist, Chris. You know, and that's the bottom line. 
I suppose it comes back to my point about tripping and scuffing and, and, and antiseptic. In the end, they will fail. And then we'll do what we always do when we fail, which is we'll mend it. Only in the interim period, we'll do enormous damage and, 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 and the planet will be a very po much poorer place. Farming will fail. You can't continue to farm the way that we're farming at the moment. It's not going to work, you know. So, but they are, they are, you know, Ms. Coffey's friends at the NFU will continue to try and pump chemicals into the soil, damage those soils irreparably, even though that we know that we've got 50 or 60 harvests left in some of the world's soils. I just think I'm really glad that economy has been mentioned, but I think also I really want to acknowledge the fact that sort of capitalism and overconsumption, all of that kind of thing, is also very, it's very purposely being wound into our culture as well. It's not just this separate economic system. It's something that on an individual basis we really engage with, and it's very, very difficult to stop. Um, we are essentially trained into overconsumption from a very early age, and so it's not like we can suddenly, even if we had a government who is interested or willing to do so, um, people would not be very happy if we suddenly shifted into a system of degrowth, which is why personally, even though I'm, there are a lot of flaws with it, I personally advocate for sort of this shift into a green economy because I feel like that then creates the potential to eventually shift into a more circular economy um, and one that is more engaged with degrowth. Um, but I think at the moment, just culturally, that's not possible. And I think because... Um, because our MPs, because our governments are kept in power, they're very invested in maintaining power, and they know that that would be such a um, abhorrent move in terms of um, maintaining popularity. It just it just would not happen right now. So I think green economy, at the moment at least, is um, is where it's at. Well, we're very nearly out of time, but we've got if we can make this just the last question, is that okay? Um, earlier on, you talked about motivation, and Chris answered that fear was a key motivator, but I believe it's also love. And so this is a question for all three of you, and indeed maybe everyone at Drink Reception. Um, what's the place in nature that you most love, that you would give everything to protect and do whatever it takes to protect? Um, I think you're right. I've just designed a new T-shirt. <laughs> it says love and rage on it. And I think it's about that balance between love and rage. Love is the fuel which enables us to rage and, and so we, we do have to go, go back to that. I think you're absolutely right. I think fear is slightly different. Fear is a, a, essentially a, a natural biological process. And it, you know, in simple terms, it leads to fight or flight. Um, despite Elon's attempts to get to Mars, there is nowhere to fly to. So that fear should motivate us to fight. So I'm not afraid of fear. I think we've grown too frightened of fear. Um, we're not allowed to fear things as much as we ought to. And that, I think, has been another uh, crime of the N mm. NGOs. Mm. You know, they've been slightly dishonest about what a predicament we are in. And they still try to satisfy us with reintroductions of door mice, as if that's a, you know, something that's going to make a meaningful difference. So I don't fear fear. And I, yes, you're right, love is the principal motivator. And for me, it's a wood in um, the New Forest where I walk, walk with itchy and scratching my dogs. If you try and take that wood from me, then maybe I'd arm myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking at the world's biggest pacifist. But, you know, th th I think there will come a crunch. There will come a crunch when people will say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And it won't be about holding hands because it will be about people's livelihoods and lives. And isn't that what we're seeing in Amazonia at the moment? I mean, they're gunfighting over their land. You know, there are people being killed on a daily basis out there. So you could already argue that there are eco-wars taking place in localised parts of the world. Yeah. But I think that when it comes to, you know, staying alive, that, that that might be something that unfortunately might manifest itself more widely. Because, as I said, don't try and come and take my wood. <laughs> if, you were quite, if you were putting HS2 through my wood... <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, I think a lot of people feel very similar. There are a lot of people who love their, their local nature, their local patch, as it were. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things is in the UK, just very quickly, the people who are currently being affected by biodiversity loss and environmental issues the most um, are the working class, the people who don't have the resources to fight it, and black and Asian communities. Those are the communities that are having um, you know, massive amounts of pollution, for example, being poured out into their... Um, into their communities and I do think 
as we start to see the shift as it sort of takes over the country more and more, it's going to start creeping into much more privileged middle class communities. And I think actually that is when we will start seeing much more pushback from people because those are the people who do have the connections, the resources, the time, the money to put up a fight rather than just try and survive. Do you have well. a specific place to do that? Um, uh, yeah, Chew Valley Lake near where I live. It's very good for waders and ducks. I'd be devastated if, it, if anything happened to it. And it's also the water source for Bristol. So we'd have some quite big problems locally. <laughs> well, I think, well, my, my favourite place at the moment is Rain and Marshes because I live in London because my husband would never move anywhere else. Um, but probably it would be out of London if I had my way. But, but Rain and Marshes is an amazing place. Peregrine falcons and, you know, hobbies and all sorts of wonderful places. Mm. And you're right, if anybody was going to do anything, I would be the first marching around you know, to protect it. So but anyway, I think we have to, we have to stop there. Um, and it just, so yeah, all I really want to do is say thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you so much for making the time. It's been really enjoyable, really inspirational. Um, I'd also like to thank UCL for providing us with the venue. And I think UCL have actually provided the drinks reception upstairs, which is fantastic. And I'd just like to thank our wonderful network of pro bono lawyers and uh, so, you know, solicitors and barristers, without whom ELF simply couldn't function and couldn't provide the lifeline to those communities that Emma was talking about earlier. And I know I've seen some of you in the room um, tonight, and I'm sorry you didn't all get the chance to ask your questions, but thank you so much for that. And thank you to all of you for coming on a rainy... Tuesday night in November and uh, joining our wonderful conversation. So thank you very much.